Hello everyone and welcome to today's Australian Airport Association webinar. Today's topic is CASA, Aerodrome Inspectors, Their Roles and Responsibilities. We are pleased to welcome our presenter for today, Daniel Etok. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posting questions to the presenter, which can be typed into the chat box at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you experience audio difficulty during the webinar, please dial the 1-800 support number listed in the chat box. I'll hand over to Daniel to begin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, Danny Etok here, and um, I'm an aerodrome inspector in the Brisbane office. I've also got in the room um, three other aerodrome inspectors um, in case there's some tricky questions that uh, need some support. I've got Greg Parnell, aerodrome inspector, Brisbane office, Russell Dwyer, aerodrome inspector, Brisbane office, and Graham Ulrich, aerodrome inspector, Brisbane office. Um, the AAA has asked myself or CASA to uh, provide an overview of the roles and responsibilities of an aerodrome inspector. Um, I've only got 30 minutes um, to um, give you a full um, um, roles and responsibilities of an aerodrome inspector would take ages. It's an exciting life, but um, it, it's sometimes very busy. So we'll get rolling. Um, the presentation overview. Uh, we'll talk about staffing updates, um, just to give you a, a, a sample of some of the changes and changes coming up. Um, our obligations um, under surveillance, um, our regulatory philosophy, um, a bit of an overview on our framework, an understanding of CASA systems and risk-based surveillance approach that we undertake currently, um, the roles and responsibilities of a CASA aerodrome inspector, and how we um, prepare and conduct um, surveillance. Um, then we'll talk about how we manage that surveillance outcomes. So first off, um, the air navigation, airspace and aerodrome staffing at the moment under for the aerodromes, we have Andrew Sparrow as the branch manager for um, ANAA. Um, we've got Ian Lobengeiger as our acting manager of aerodromes. And we have two team leaders, Joe Hain for Team 1 and Richard Green for Team 2. Um, the, two the two teams have got different areas of responsibility. Um, team 1 has the um, southern region and western region mostly, um, which consists of the southern region is Victoria, Tasmania. The western region is um, South Australia and Western, um, western Australia. Um, the Team 2 look after the Sydney region, which is most of New South Wales. Uh, the Eastern region, which is the um, uh, South East Queensland sort of section. And um, also the Northern region, which is uh, Northern Queensland and um, Northern Territory. Um, the, the aerodrome inspectors to support Joe Hain under Team 1 is Brad Sinclair in the Melbourne office. Um, Scott Whiting in the Adelaide office. And in the Perth office, Kirsten Sanford and Mark Buxy. Um, aerodrome inspectors for Team 2 under Richard Green, who is acting team leader at this stage, is um, the Brisbane office, Russell Dwyer, which I've introduced you to, Greg Parnell, I introduced you to, and Graham Olwick, and obviously myself. Um, you can see two of the good looking roosters on the right hand side there. Um, actually, today, Greg, it's Greg Parnell's last day, and uh, we're going to have a couple of coldies after this webinar. But um, Greg's leaving us after about 35 years of um, service to um, oh, the CASA, Department of Aviation, Department of Transport. You know, name changes through the, throughout history. Um, Russell Dwyer is um, was considering retirement, but is now decided to stick around for another four years. In the city office, we've got. Slavica Desbosinich and Ian Bailey supporting us as well. All right, CASA surveillance ob obligations. Um, CASA's key role is to conduct safety regulation of civil um, air operation in Australian territory and for aircraft that go over um, outside Australian territories. Obviously, aerodromes are a key component of that um, safety regulation. Um, role um, as it's very difficult for an airplane to leave or get to anywhere without an aerodrome. So it's um, a huge responsibility of the aerodrome operators to ensure 
the safety outcomes of uh, managing an aerodrome. Um, CAS is also responsible for showing, ensuring the Australian administration of airspace and, um, and its safety and, and, and use. Obviously, aerodrome operators also have um, a great deal of responsibility ensuring the airspace around an aerodrome um, is managed and monitored and reported to in a safe manner as well. Um, the requirement for CAS to perform these roles is included in the Civil Aviation Act and the Act of the Airspace Act 2007. Um, our philosophy, um, CAS's regular philosophy is um, founded on that Australian citizens um, and other people travelling within Australia should be um, confident that there's a good safety culture and um, governance of um, safety outcomes and frameworks within um, the operating environment of aerodromes and other areas of, of, of um, the operations of airspace as well. Also, CASA is committed to maintaining the trust and respect of the community, the aviation community. Um, it's also mindful of its um, safety, air safety, and takes into account all sorts of relevant considerations, including costs when reviewing that, that, those um, safety outcomes. Um, CASA also takes a risk-based approach to regulatory action and decision making. CASA performs its functions consistently with Australia's international obligations. And CASA approaches regulatory functions consultatively and collaboratively. Um, we also um, try to communicate meaningfully with all relevant stakeholders and aerodrome, op aerodrome operators, I think, would support us in, in that aerodrome. Um, aerodrome inspectors are quite um, um, open to communicating with um, the industry as a whole. Um, we do have a fairly balanced need for consistency with the need for flexibility and embraces and employs a rational just, just culture. Um, CAS's um, aviation regulatory framework is, is in Australia is made up of acts, regulations, associated le legislative instruments and guidance materials. All this information can be found on our web website. Um, there's a link on the page there that'll take you there, and there's um, a fair few items in there that you might find find interesting. Um, our philosophy continues. The Act is the um, Civil Aviation Act 1988. The Act is the legislation that powers the development of regulation, the capacity for them to be enforced. CASAR is divided into a number of parts, each of which have been associated with manual standards. Um, some samples of, of the parts are Part 11, um, the Regulatory Administrative Procedures Process, um, Part 21, PET 21 Certification and Airworthiness Requirements, um, 23 Airworthiness, 25, again, Airworthiness Standards for Airplanes, 29, 32. There's a whole heap of them. The one that we um, um, carry out our surveillance under is Part 139 for Aerodromes. We also look at part 175 and also part 99. Uh, we deal with a lot of um, internal parts within us, within um, CASA to ensure that we get a broad cross, crossing of the, of the um, regulations. Obviously, our, our CASA is part 139 aerodromes and our manual standards is, um, or our MOS is part 139 for aerodromes as well. Um, as well as supported by guidance materials such as um, advisory circulars, um, caps, and any other standards that may be applicable to um, aerodromes. Um, the regulatory framework, um, there are obviously unregulated aerodromes that CASA does not um, um, regulate, um, aircraft landing areas. Uh, these are usually council or private small aerodromes and um, CASA doesn't really get involved in those areas. However, we do have um, a cap um, that gives guidance um, for managing or developing an ALA. Um, certain other aerodromes, this is with um, air transports less than um, nine seats and uh, only operated once a week or thereabouts. Um, 
registered air drones. These are air drones that, that are um, less than greater than nine seats and less than thirty seats. Um, re registered air drones and certified air drones, which are seats of greater than thirty seats, as it exists at this stage. Um, we have currently approximately 195 certified air drones that um, the inspectorate that I was introduced you to before have to look after, and also registered 130 um, air drones, which is about 325, I think. A quick count there, for, and there, and I told you the amount of air drone inspectors available to look after all those. So we're a very busy lot um, in doing our jobs day to day. At the moment, um, the basis of our surveillance is based on the systems-based surveillance and um, the systems and elements that the air drones are to be um, managed by. So we look at and focus on the authorizations, authorizations holders' understanding of all the elements in their operating system, um, focusing on how the elements integrate. So we have a look at the systems, um, usually the systems are based around the safety management system, the air drone manual and the AEPs, and how you integrate all those together and manage those in your day-to-day -day operations. Um, and determining whether the systems are complete or maybe missing components. Also, we look at the safety-related risks and how you're managing those risks through your um, safety management system, or if you don't have a safety management system, maybe just your risk-based approach to managing your aerodrome. Um, we also look at how you're, during a surveillance, how your elements interact with other systems to ensure that you get the greatest safety outcome. During the process, some operators, not very many, I don't think within the aerodromes, um, see a perception of an aerodrome inspector as a grizzly old bloke that's coming to just give you bad news. However, we see us as a, a team working with industry to ensure a safety outcome. Um, our accountability is to promote aviation safety, um, to collaborate with industry to ensure the operators are aware um, of technical and regulatory matters, provide guidance to industry on the regulations and standards for, for aerodromes. Um, when we're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, coordinate with the industry the implementation of safety management systems and um, lately we've been trying to increase the awareness of um, an advancement of safety management systems. Some airdromes are still uh, working on the old SMS approach um, where um, we know that now that the SMS approach is maturing and that um, you know the uh, four um, systems or products and the 15 elements uh, now need to be considered um, in developing an SMS and managing it appropriately. Um, we also put input into implementation review of regulations and standards procedures and that's been happening at the moment. Everyone's aware of the um, post implementation review of the MOS, um, the PIR, uh, which the um, Darren Angelo is um, um, running. Um, we all put in uh, our uh, review of the um, new MOS and um, sent it off to Darren for his consideration, as I know that everybody else has, and the AAA especially, put a large uh, review in to um, Darren. And uh, we've been working with Darren closely in the implementation and review of those regulations and standards. Um, also, we task as we do the task as necessary, including, I suppose, the major component of our job is um, surveillance. Um, our day-to-day -day safety expectations, um, obviously, handling industry inquiries. There's a big um, where the phones ring and hot around our desk all day long, and we have to uh, handle industry inquiries against um, standards and regulations, things like that. Um, we also assess air drone certificate applications, and there's a few been coming in over the years with the mining boom, the up and down, and all that sort of stuff. Um, assess requests for changes certificate holder. Uh, once a um, company changes hands or something like that, it's got to be reassessed and, and readdressed. 
um, assess registration applications for aerodromes. Um, we also assess approvals for authorised uh, persons to uh, undertake ASIs or aviation safety, uh, aerodrome safety inspections. Um, we um, assess master plans and make comments on master plans that come out. Um, all the majors have master plan reviews every five years and councils go along that line as well. Um, we assess and review major development plans, um, infrastructure upgrades and things like that and it's very important to us that you communicate with us early on infrastructure upgrades to ensure that once it's completed or before it's actually uh, put, implemented that it's uh, meeting standards so there's no um, cost to the airdrome operator in the future for not managing um, the um, review process or the development process for infrastructure upgrades. Uh, we undertake obstacle limitation service assessments. Um, that's a big part of our jobs, cranes going up, NBN towers, telecommunications towers, all sorts of developments around the larger aerodromes and that. So it takes a bit of our time assessing the OLS in, con in consultation with the aerodrome operator and air services. Uh, we uh, will comment on met method of working plans. And also we have our own internal and external training requirements to, continue to ensure that we maintain our um, standard of training within the organisation. Um, carrying out aerodrome surveillance. Um, obviously we've got to organise surveillance uh, with the operator. Um, we've got a new system coming into play now, the NSSP, where we, we're issued what aerodromes have got to be inspected over the next 12 months. We are now sending out emails as soon as possible to the operator to ensure that they're aware that we may be visiting during a period of a month, um, just to ensure that they're um, available for that. Then as we get closer, we need to clarify that and, and tie it down a fair bit. Prior to an on-site visit, um, we conduct a review of the aerodrome manual. Um, obviously the aerodrome emergency plan if you have one. We review the safety management system and as I discussed before, we now have a tool that um, assists us in the assessment of safety management systems because of the, I suppose, worldwide requirement for safety management systems to mature. And any other information collected since the, collected since the last surveillance, like um, you know, we might have got some stuff that we've, we've trimmed and uh, put on file that we need to review when we go on site. Oh, especially if there's any upgrades that have happened since our last visit, uh, we might want to review that before we go out and make sure that we're looking at the right areas. Um, when we get on site, we conduct an entry meeting just to discuss the process and um, methodology going forward for the surveillance and to make sure everybody's happy with the approach. Um, we obviously undertake an inspection of the facility. It's probably a large part of the, of the process. That includes a night light inspection if you have lights available for um, night operations. Um, we undertake a systems review, as I discussed before, with the operator, including but not limited to, and I've already advised this before, safety management system, the aerodrome manual, with the, but this is with the operator now, um, information um, to be included in the aerodrome manual, any amendments of the aerodrome manual that have been undertaken, and uh, whether CASA has been provided with copies of those amendments, and, we're, and um, just review those. those types of issues. Obviously a big part for the larger aerodromes and the aerodrome emergency planning. Um, we have a very good look at that. We look at how you're monitoring and reviewing and reporting on the obstacles around the aerodrome, if any, and how you're making notice of those obstacles. Uh, we look at any aerodrome technical or safety inspections that have been uh, conducted and ensure that you've um, undertaken to um, address the, any corrective actions within those reports. Um, wildlife management is a huge um, risk uh, at aerodromes, so we have a very good look at any wildlife management plans that um, may have been developed for that aerodrome. And we also assist our Part 99 people by undertaking a review of any drugs and alcohol management plans that you have in play. Um, we look at how you're conducting service civilian inspections to make sure that you're obviously compliant and also to ensure that it's covering all the risks associated with the operations. 
we look at your AIP URSA documentation to make sure it's up to date and that's also part of 175 as well to ensure that you're reviewing those um, documentations um, annually and that there's evidence that you have done a review of those documentations annually. Um, any training that the authorisation holder has for the AROs and any other people that are involved in managing the aerodrome, um, what sort of training you've had, what sort of recurrency training you've got planning, planned to ensure that you maintain your training requirements. And how you're reporting, how that all that um, reporting process as well. Once the surveillance is finished, um, we tend to go away for a couple of hours and put our notes together in preparation for the exit meeting. And at the exit meeting we advise, although through out the surveillance we would have advised you guys anyway um, where we're at, but at the exit meeting it's a final chance for us to, do, to just to discuss any findings that may have come across and maybe discuss a little bit further at the exit meeting and um, how the reporting process back to the authorisation holder will be undertaken. Um, on the return to the office after the surveillance, we've got to file all the records, all the evidence uh, provided and recorded as part of the surveillance. We've got to prepare a surveillance report, that's my favourite part of surveillance, and um, ensure that it's been reviewed internally before it's completed and approved and sent out to the, um, the um, airdrome operator or the authorisation holder. Um, and then issue that report once it's approved, hopefully within um, 20 working days. Um, then we review the operator's response to any findings, if any uh, are given, uh, accept or reject the operator's responses because um, if it's not responded on properly or, or hasn't been considered appropriately, um, the responses can be rejected and, um, and ha have a, a second think about how to respond to them. And then we manage the safety findings until acquitted. Now with aerodromes, there's, um, it's a bit different to other parts of CASA where there may be um, approvals required, uh, funding required and all that and um, acquittal may take some time. I know there's a couple of my aerodromes that I've been managing um, safety findings for over three years but evidence every now and then is provided to ensure that it is being managed and we just work together to ensure that we get to a final conclusion. Uh, just a quick one on the safety findings. Um, safety findings are non-punishable options instead of enforcement. Um, safety finding is an administrative process to ensure that, um, and we only give them to the authorisation holder if we, we, we believe that there's a working cooperation between the authorisation holder and CASA to um, manage the um, safety findings going forward. However, if a safety finding is provided, um, the safety finding uh, response needs to be meaningful and include the remedial action, which is the immediate action, the root cause analysis. Now the root cause analysis um, requires some sort of consideration on why the um, finding was issued in the first place. Um, there is a, a policy um, or a training method that we use for a 5Y response to root cause analysis, but as long as it's a, a considered response back to the air drain inspector, um, not just, oh, I wasn't aware of it, um, the, the finding will not be rejected. And then a corrective action to address the root cause analysis that you identified as the issue. Um, and this slide just more or less um, addresses what I, I advised in the previous slide. Just jump ahead a little bit. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah, the root cause there is five whys. Um, identify the possible cause, identify the root cause, identify the communication challenges, prioritise those challenges, and ensure that you've addressed that finding in a meaningful way. Um, and then have your SMS committee review the whole process to find out why it fell over or why it wasn't addressed prior to um, an inspection. Obviously, like I said before, um, we manage the safety findings to, to acquittal. Now, um, CASA needs to have a response within 21 days, or it's a regulatory requirement with a safety find to have a response within 21 days. That doesn't mean that the finding needs to be completed within 21 days, it just needs to be um, considered within that 21 days. And at some sort of program timetable with milestones, 
can be um, provided for an extension of time. And like I said, I've been working with a, lot, a few of my aerodromes over a long period, but they have given me um, timetables with milestones and they provided uh, quick risk assessments and their mitigating measures until it's completed. Um, CAS's risk acceptance process is that if the response is going to be greater than 21 days, then uh, my manager of aerodromes um, will need to consider that. If it's greater than three months, it means it needs to go to coordinated enforcement, which is just uh, a process, again, within CASA to ensure that the management of CASA uh, realises they're taking on some risk by extending, extending the time frame for a safety finding. It's not um, actually going to any sort of legal avenue. Obviously, if you're going to acquit a finding, um, it needs verification of the completion of that um, uh, works. Um, some sort of evidence and, you know, either photos or date stamps meter data um, with date stamp meter, meter, metadata, sorry, evidence of that or the actual documents and amendments um, provided to the, to the inspector responsible. Um, and that's about it. Um, I hope I um, explained that in a reasonable sense. Um, I haven't been checking to see if there's any questions, but it doesn't look like there is any. So, um, oh, is there? There's three questions. I can't see any questions at the moment. Oh, sorry, there is, sorry. Um, Peter, with the new changes to the MOS, will CASA require service civilian and wildlife inspections to be more risk-based, e.g. undertake a risk assessment when unserviceability is discovered as opposed to just reporting the issue. Um, well, as I said before, that um, if you're responding to a finding or anything like that, serviceability um, inspections and things like that, you need to, obviously if you find some issues, it needs to be risk assessed as part of your um, process of reporting up to management and provide you know, them the um, issues that you may have with regard to risk associated with those, those um, findings, those um, service inspections. Um, I think that's the only question. I don't know if I answered that, understood that or answered that properly. Um, from Glenn R, good luck, Greg. Thanks, guys. I can't see it. Sorry. Oh, Vicky, can I, can I, as a member of a company selling products within the industry, contact my local inspector for advice and guidance in accordance with the relevant specs? Um, we're not a consultancy service. Uh, what we can do is, if there's um, some clarification required on a standard or a reg, yes, we can give you some clarification. Uh, but we do not give guidance on how to go forward on any sort of products or um, works that you may be undertaking. Um, Julie H, will you make a copy of the surveillance tools available? Yes. Any any of my air drones or authorization holders that um, and they know who they are who are listed under me, I can give you um, a copy of all my tools uh, that I use for surveillance. If you request, uh, and I do it for the major airports, if you do request, I can give you my working sheets um, a couple of weeks out prior to the surveillance to give, give you a self-auditing process before I arrive. So yes, I think the question is, uh, the answer is, Julie H. Um, we are looking to determine a compliance table and register against MOS. Is it still true that the new MOS numbers will be aligned with the old? IE lining part nine. Yes, I'm. I'm pretty confident that that's the case. That they're very close in alignment. I think Darren worked hard to ensure that they are aligned with the old MOS. So it's not too much work to find out where you're going. Uh, there might be sub um, parts that might be a little bit different, but the uh, I believe lining will still be part nine, section nine. Yeah, the chat, I've just been told by my boss that the chapters will be the same, but there may be some slight movement of information from one chapter to another. That, within, the chapter. within the chapter, sorry, within the chapter. Yeah. Um, 
We can say, understood, thank you. Heather, good luck, and thank you, Greg, from all the team at Archerfield Airport. There you go, Heather just said thank you. Uh, Magic, thank you. Shelley, thanks, Danny. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, cheers, mate. Thanks very much. Very helpful, quite. Yeah, they're starting, they're starting to go by a bit quickly now. Mainly they're just saying thank you. So um, I think we might, I think I've hit the half now, Mark. I think I might pass it back to um, the coordinator. Thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Please take a moment to complete the survey which has appeared on your screen. We thank you in advance for your feedback and wish you a pleasant afternoon.